As you know, the, uh, the Boathouse uh, Lunch series is supported by uh, Hewlett Packard, which has been a very good uh, partner of uh, ASPE for a number of years now, and I'm delighted that they will continue that uh, process over the course of uh, 2013 as well. Uh, can you please uh, welcome Mr James Hipwell from HP, who will introduce uh, our speaker. Uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, I'm pleased to be here today uh, representing Hewlett Packard as part of our ongoing sponsorship for Defence and Security uh, Lunch Series. This is a first for me today. I have never had the privilege before of introducing a Lord. Um, so I'm delighted to be introducing uh, Lord Michael Williams of Baglin, and I'm looking forward to hearing his perspective on the Asian region. Asia is a massive opportunity for a company like HP, both as a market and as a location to improve the efficiency of our supply chain. We also recognise that with globalisation comes responsibilities. Companies like HP, would ha uh, who have significant operations in the Asia Pacific, can and should be a force for positive change. While China and other Asian destinations like Malaysia, the Philippines and Indonesia offer us the ability to source lower cost labour to improve our overall competitiveness, it also offers an opportunity for us in partnership with our suppliers to improve standards and conditions. And as a large player, this has a net positive effect on conditions more broadly, which can be a significant force for positive social change in the region. To support this, last year, we refreshed our supplier standards and guidelines with the aim of improving, and working, uh, improving the working conditions of employees in factories supplying HP. We believe this has had a positive impact, with the New York Times reporting earlier this year and some notable improvements in standards within the electronics industry in China. Which brings me to my official duties for today, to introduce our guest speaker, distinguished visiting fellow at Chatham House, Lord Michael Williams. This brings me to another first. This is the first time I've actually met someone from Chatham House, <laughs> having had many conversations governed by its rules. <laughs> It would be probably a great disappointment to the assembled media in the room if we were to operate under Chatham House rules today. In addition to his Chatham House role, Lord Williams, as Governor of the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London, a trustee of the BBC and a member of the House of Lords. He served with the UN in Cambodia and the Balkans and was Director for Asia and the Middle East in the UN Department of Political Affairs, New York. Between 1999 and 2005, he was special advisor to two British foreign secretaries, Robin Cook and Jack Straw. In his final UN posting, he was UN Under Secretary General in the Middle East. His PhD from the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London looked at Islam and the revolt in colonial Indonesia. And last year, he was a member of the UK parliamentary delegation to Indonesia. Please join me in welcoming Lord Williams. Well, it's a real pleasure to, uh, to be here today in this uh, wonderful restaurant and the setting alongside the lake. Uh, I'm not going to say much about the weather. I mean, uh, I could have stayed in London. Uh, <laughs> no, but it's a great time to be back in Australia. I, mean, I have a sense uh, in Australia and also in, in Southeast Asia, which I've gone back to several times in the last uh, 12 months, of, uh, of, of real optimism, of real progress that I've seen firsthand uh, in countries like Indonesia, uh, and also most recently with regard to uh, uh, Burma. When you come to Australia, you always make new friends, and you always see a lot of old friends. Um, uh, here today we have uh, General Gordon, Ian Gordon, with whom I worked in uh, Jerusalem, another one of our great successes, Ian. Uh, and also um, Graham Dobell from uh, ABC, who I worked with more than 20 years ago. Uh, in Singapore, and uh, Graham reminded me that the last time we met, I was going off to the uh, Cambodia peace talks, and little did I know to my uh, first involvement uh, with the UN as Director of Human Rights in Cambodia in the, uh, in the early 90s. Um, I wanted to talk today about something which you're all too familiar with, the US pivot to Asia, not least because of the, the speech given by uh, President Obama on the 17th of November 2011 
to uh, your parliament. It's a little bit daunting uh, coming as a Brit to talk about this in uh, Australia, and particularly as Peter Jennings, amongst others, has written uh, so, so well about it. But let me say at the outset, as, uh, as a Brit who has spent a lot of time in the region, uh, lived in countries like Indonesia, Cambodia, Singapore, of course, I, I recognize uh, the, the, the essence of uh, the pivot to Asia that, uh, as Obama said, I think, uh, in the speech, in his own always lofty, inspirational words, here is the future. Uh, there's absolutely uh, no denying that, uh, that you know, as a Brit and as a European, the future of a um, uh, global economy depends so much on uh, Asia Pacific. Uh, I have no trouble with that, and I want my own country, which is far away, the UK, as much as is possible to embrace it also. And one thing that I think the, the present government, of, uh, led by uh, David Cameron, has done very well is to make uh, a, a substantial um, improvement, if I can use that word, in, in UK-Australian relations, uh, and pr particularly in establishing now the annual Orkman uh, meetings, which bring together the foreign secretaries and the defense secretaries uh, of the two countries. Um, the pivot to Asia uh, is, from a U.S. perspective, also the right thing to do. The intent is there, and it's very clear. And uh, like you, I mean, the U.S. increasingly depends upon Asian markets uh, for its goods and upon Asian investors uh, in uh, China and ab above all, of course, uh, in Asia and above all, of course, uh, in uh, China. I, my concern is that the, while the intent is very clear, the first five years of, of this pivot uh, are going to be the most critical. They're going to be the most critical because one needs to move ahead in policy terms. Uh, and, but at the same time, the difficulties facing the U.S. as, if you like, the leader of a democratic world uh, and a country most committed to global security are not going to be easy in uh, making that shift. It's a shift that I want to see, uh, but that I have some... Uh, reservations as to the capability of the U.S. to wrest itself from uh, existing obligations. Uh, and to some extent, and I'm sorry to say this, as I'm trying to get away from the Middle East myself, uh, above all in the Middle East. The word pivot is, 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 is interesting. If you look back, actually, uh, one of the first people to use this was actually a British geographer and strategist uh, a man called Halford John Mackinder, who more than a century ago um, in 1904, uh, looking at strategy and the evolving globe, uh, and especially perhaps the rise of Germany as a power, contesting then uh, uh, Great Britain, he wrote a famous essay in 1904 called The Geographical Pivot to History, which, like so many of these things, uh, you kind of forget about, but it's worth uh, returning to and uh, uh, rereading. Now, more than a century later, the Obama uh, administration, not consciously, I believe, has used precisely this term in adjusting the focus or trying to adjust the focus of US foreign policy away from the Atlantic and the Middle East to what is undeniably the center of the world economy. Kurt Campbell, who has now uh, left office, um, in an interview with one of your newspapers uh, yesterday, I can't remember now whether it was the Sydney Morning Herald or, or the Australian, uh, spoke about the region being the cockpit of the world economy. But recognition of that and uh, delivering policy in that regard 
uh, remains uh, an ambition, I believe. Uh, I, I mentioned the departure of Kurt Campbell. One also thinks of the extraordinary record of Hillary Clinton, uh, Secretary of State, um, in the past, uh, in the first term of the uh, Obama administration, um, and especially the the attention that she paid relentlessly to this region, uh, attending every meeting. It seemed to me, I mean, ASEAN, ARF. East Asia Summit, um, even South Pacific uh, uh, Forum. That was quite extraordinary. Uh, now, in policy, you always need drivers. Um, and uh, Hillary Clinton and, and uh, Kurt Campbell, uh, in that regard, were uh, absolutely essential. Uh, we have to see if their successors have the recognition of the region and the ambition to drive forward. Uh, and of course, to be fair to the successors, to uh, Hillary Clinton and Kurt Campbell, these are very, very early days of uh, the second term of the uh, Obama uh, administration. And a lot of this has to come from the president uh, himself. It's not going to be easy. We know about the econo economic problems of the United States itself of the financial uh, constraints. And in some of the economic areas, it seems to me, it's not so easy to, to go forward. Um, the, uh, the ambitious trade agreement, the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which doesn't include all the, the, the major economies in the region, uh, those negotiations uh, are not going to be um, straightforward. Now, neither will be the negotiations already started with regard to a US-European Union free trade area. Um, uh, I don't want to be too Eurosceptic, but nothing with the EU is, is straightforward. Uh, but uh, at, at the same time, I think that those negotiations will, will actually progress a pace, if one can use that expression with regard to the EU, uh, but I would expect to see, I would expect to see uh, that that sort of agreement uh, come to fruition um, uh, in the next few years. The TPP, I think, is going to be more difficult. Now, I don't need to tell you that the U.S., of course, has been a Pacific power since the middle of the 19th century. The first significant war it fought outside its own borders. Uh, was with Spain, and the main theater of that uh, conflict was, by and large, uh, uh, the Philippines. Uh, and let it not be forgotten that uh, America's entry into the Second World War, by then raging for more than two years, uh, was triggered, of course, by the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor on December 8, uh, 1941, long after the Battle of Britain, and when the German Wehrmacht were at the gates of Moscow, uh, Churchill's nightmare was, was finally ended uh, with the realization that with the participation of the United States, uh, the war could be won, something that the, uh, Britain and Russia alone uh, would not have been uh, capable uh, of. Uh, I mean, you as, a, as, as Australia, of course, uh, we, we greatly appreciate uh, our bilateral relationship with the UK and also the very close relationship that Australia enjoys with the United States. Uh, I think it's great that Australia is back on the Security Council. Uh, in my view, that was long overdue. It's actually about a quarter of a century uh, since you were back on there, and I hope that that cements even fur further UK, Australian, and US uh, Australian uh, relationships. Um, and we know, too, the commitments that uh, Australia has made uh, in, in Iraq and uh, also in Afghanistan. And uh, I pay respect to that. Uh, your government has, has published a major white paper, Australia in the Asian Century, which outlines, uh, I think, a sort of roadmap for Australia's uh, engagement 
uh, with the region. And hot on the heels of that has come, uh, I think, a new uh, national security uh, paper. As someone who's uh, spent a lot of time uh, in and on Indonesia, as it were, uh, I also uh, would like to pay tribute for what I believe to be the enormous improvement in uh, relations between Australia and uh, Indonesia in recent years, uh, the annual leaders' meetings uh, that, that you now have, the, the concrete um, encouragement and assistance that you give to Indonesia in so many fields. Uh, last year, one of the things I did in Indonesia was visit JCLAC, the uh, Jakarta Center for Law Enforcement Cooperation, which somewhat bizarrely is situated in the central Javanese city of Samarang and not in, in Jakarta. But leaving that aside, uh, it's a fantastic institution. And it's now trained uh, thousands of uh, Indonesian uh, police officers. There are a couple of Brits uh, there working uh, uh, with the, the Australian colleagues. Uh, and I think that, that has been a very successful institution. And for you, as for the UK, but uh, certainly for Australia, um, the fight against terrorism and progress in that regard within Indonesia is so important. Uh, and I think that that uh, progress is, is being made. I referred earlier to Kurt uh, Campbell, whom I have uh, always had uh, great admiration and respect for. He's somebody uh, I know, and uh, he's somebody who has long recognized the importance of um, uh, the, the region. Um, I, in one of his memorable remarks in recent testimony before Congress, he, he said, and I quote, most of, the, most of the history of the 21st century is going to be written in the Asia-Pacific region. This is the dominant arena of strategic interaction. And I think that's very, very true. Uh, I would not quibble with that uh, at all. What, of course, remains to be seen is what sort of history will uh, be written on the pages uh, to come in the coming years, the coming decades, and uh, in the century uh, ahead. The economic strength of the region, particularly for you know, a European in the midst of all our economic woes, uh, is, is easily uh, recognizable. We want to see great economic progress here because I think, as David Cameron's government has, has, has recognized, progress in, t in, in terms of our own economy I think, to a considerable extent, despite the distances, uh, relies enormously on um, boosting trade and uh, investment. It's a two-way process between the UK and uh, uh, the Asia-Pacific uh, region. But I go back to the question of what sort of history will it be. The economic progress, and indeed I think the social progress, and some of the political progress. Uh, we, uh, we, we, we can accept, I'm not saying we should take them for granted, uh, but the progress has been quite remarkable. I mean, there are many, many st statistics I remember in the uh, Asia Pacific White Paper, but there, there's one about sort of life expectancy in uh, Vietnam, which I think over the last 25 years has increased from 45 to 69. Uh, I mean, that's really quite astonishing and, and, you know, matches the progress that was made, for example, in Britain and then in the rest of Europe uh, in the 19th century. Not, not just matches it, but actually outpaces it in, in many ways in its speed. But while economic process is something that we can be uh, assured of, uh, and together with it, uh, consequent social... Uh, progress and so on. Uh, there remain issues in, in the region, uh, and one uh, which uh, increasingly uh, um, Chatham House, where I'm doing some work, is focusing on is the role of China, to be frank, and uh, what sort of great power uh, it will be. It is already a great power, 
Um, but there's a, a question mark against it, a question mark in terms of its internal governance, uh, which of course is far from being a democracy, which is not to deny that there is not real pluralism within China now, uh, an economic pluralism, a social pluralism. I mean, when you look uh, at, uh, at the internet, um, there's actually a real sort of uh, pluralism there, and a questioning of uh, central authority, you know, why are we doing this? Uh, what for? And, uh, and so on. But at the end of the day, while it's no longer the dictatorship of the proletariat of the Maoist era, it's still a one-party state. Uh, and I think that um, that raises problems. It's also a one-party state in a sort of slightly odd way, in that the comrades in the old days, uh, the Communist Party in Moscow and in Eastern Europe, one thing that they had right, as it were, uh, is what we ex take for granted in democracies, which is political and civilian control of uh, the military. Um, uh, that was as true in the Soviet Union as it was in the United States or Britain or uh, Australia. Uh, I mean, Stalin in that regard was absolutely ruthless. I mean, remove generals in days and not remove them for uh, another post, but often, uh, all, all too sadly, they, uh, they departed uh, this world. Um, those days, thankfully, uh, are behind us. But uh, there is a question in my mind about the civilian control of the PLA. Um, and coming back to the region, one uh, is struck uh, by the fact that we seem to have coincidentally, simultaneously, uh, two issues of Chinese assertiveness uh, in sea lanes, which I, I don't have to tell you uh, how important those are. In the South China Sea, I mean, that's been ongoing for some time. Uh, I mean, sadly, I remember writing about it 80, uh, not 80 years, 20 years ago. Um, but what, what, what I find new is the fact that this problem it comes back in the South China Sea and simultaneously in the East China Sea. If anything, it's more dangerous in the East China Sea um, because of uh, the fact that it, it actually involves two, uh, China and Japan, warships and air airplanes uh, operating in, in quite close proximity uh, and with the, the possibility uh, of uh, an accident, an incident, uh, all too apparent. We've, we've seen incidents again uh, in the past year in uh, uh, South Asia between China and the Philippines. Um, now, as, as one colleague reminded me in London, well, that's not too important because the Philippines doesn't have much of a navy, uh, which uh, is not the case, of course, I don't need to tell you, uh, with regard to uh, Japan. Um, and one, one's, one's also noted not only a reluctance on the part of China to address these issues, uh, but even attempts to thwart um, initiatives to uh, um, deal with these issues. And I think in particular the, the uh, uh, of the ASEAN Code of Conduct. I had to give a talk on ASEAN, um, which doesn't necessarily draw crowds in London, um, uh, in, in July uh, last year, but uh, th thankf thankfully, serendipitously, uh, one sometimes helped as a speaker by events. Events, dear boy, as uh, Harold Macmillan uh, uh, memorably said, he said that's what a foreign policy is about, events. Um, but my talk coincided with the Phnom Penh summit uh, in July, where, of course, where our, our ASEAN friends, Indonesia, Singapore, others, uh, effortless work of, of um, Martin Natalagawa, the Indonesian foreign minister, um, to move forward on a code of conduct. You know, it didn't happen because of uh, Chinese pressure on the, the host, uh, Cambodia. Um, now, now, since then, I think we've stepped back a little, um, but I don't believe one can take 
too much uh, confidence and, uh, and optimism. Uh, and, and the idea of any legally binding code of conduct is, um, uh, alas, not going to uh, happen. So the US is, is needed in the region uh, more than, than ever. I think the, the problem for the president um, is the economic situation, but also other demands. Soon, uh, next year, the UK and Australia and uh, the United States uh, can look forward to the withdrawal from uh, Afghanistan. But this is not going to be a withdrawal like the withdrawal from Iraq. First of all, the size of any um, post-14 uh, US present will be substantial. And I think one is looking at as many as 10,000 uh, uh, troops, um, together with sort of enablers, special forces, um, and uh, air support. Uh, Afghanistan, Afghanistan still remains uh, a critical arena, a critical arena in the fight against terrorism. There's the risk of a vacuum uh, inviting others in. And India and Pakistan could all too easily uh, fight their rivalries at the expense of Afghanistan uh, and its people. So an American presence will need to be uh, uh, there. Pakistan itself, of course, is of, of, of great concern. And uh, the U.S. cannot I ignore the problems of, of jihadism, of terrorism uh, within that country. And to some extent, even the uh, question of the Pakistan army itself, um, which uh, has uh, been very testing for the U.S. in 2011 and 2012. But there are other Middle East issues which, uh, alas, sap I, I think the U.S. commitment to uh, the pivot to Asia, and I think above all of the Iranian nuclear issue, uh, the talks uh, in Almaty this week seem to have made uh, some progress. Both uh, the uh, P5 plus Germany uh, spoke, uh, spoke in a reasonably uh, optimistic man manner afterwards. So did the Iranian foreign minister. Saeed Jalili, uh, but how much he counts back home in Tehran is, is a, a, a different matter. Not only does Iran, of course, absorb the attention of the presidency and of the State Department of the Pentagon, the CIA, and uh, that whole sort of Washington uh, uh, waterfront, uh, but it also absorbs military resources and, above all, naval resources with regard to the Straits of Hormuz uh, and the, the critical criticality of, of uh, maintaining those straits open and having a military uh, uh, presence which the Iranians are uh, aware of. I, I don't go on about uh, Middle East uh, difficulties because I could keep you here for some time and I have uh, no wish uh, to do that. But the present crisis in, in Syria, which I think is profound and is already showing signs of migrating to Lebanon and to uh, Iraq, real divisions between Sunni and Shia, almost like something from the, the religious wars of uh, the 17th century in Europe, uh, that, that is also something that uh, the U.S. cannot uh, walk a, a, a away from. I think President Obama, in the, in the remarkable speech he, he made here, I, I found it actually remarkable in many ways. One, the recognition of Asia Pacific, uh, but he also confronted China in a way in that speech. And, uh, you know, going back to the speech at uh, the beginning of this week and rereading it, um, the remarks on China were very pointed. Um, he, uh, he said, you know, history has told us, which actually sounds a bit too neo-Marxist, actually, in some ways. History has told us that rule by one man and rule by the committee um, can no longer prevail in this world. Now, you know, personally, I believe that. 
But if you're sitting in uh, Beijing in the PLA or in the, in the Politburo, uh, those are not particularly welcome uh, words. And here there's a certain paradox, I think, in American policy. The need to try and engage China, to bring it along with us in uh, a march to uh, economic and social progress and so on. Uh, but at, at, at the same time, to, to, to get uh, China to behave by uh, acceptable norms uh, in this region. The other difficulty for the US and also for UK and, and Australia is that in many issues in the world, I've mentioned Iran, uh, I didn't mention North Korea, we need China's support on those issues. Uh, I mean, they are a permanent member of the Security Council. I think you know their participation in the Iran talks is absolutely uh, vital. I mean, just to, to conclude, conclude, I mean, Obama, in, in his remarks here in this city, said of the Pacific and Asia, here is the future. And of that, I think there is no doubt. The problem is, uh, as history has too often uh, shown us, is that the past does not give us a free hand. Thank you very much. Michael, thanks very much for that very thoughtful uh, presentation. Maybe just to get the ball rolling, I'll, uh, I'll ask, uh, take the uh, moderator's right, uh, uh, Michael, to ask a question myself. Uh, it, it's uh, great to have someone here who uh, started uh, his professional life as an Indonesianist and, and has obviously retained a deep interest in Indonesia. Uh, my question is, uh, I think we now start to see an Indonesia which realises that its, its influence um, can, expend, can, can extend way beyond the, the ASEAN uh, Club of Ten. Uh, Indonesia is a member of the G20, for example. It's, it's starting to think about its role as a, as a global middle power. Um, how do you see that evolving? And um, in particular, what, what lessons or implications should we in Australia draw from, from that sense of Indonesia uh, looking at a sort of a much wider possibility for itself? Mm -hmm. That's a really good question, Peter. Uh, I think uh, what I would say is don't be too concerned about uh, that. Uh, and in fact, welcome it in uh, many ways. I mean, Indonesia particularly now as a developing economy and uh, as a, a fairly robust uh, democracy, has a lot to offer, not only in this region, Southeast Asia um, and uh, the, the Pacific, but far wider than that. Uh, Indonesia has actually been quite a strong contributor over the years uh, to UN peacekeeping. In fact, their first, first participation in peacekeeping was in the Congo in 1960, more than uh, half a century ago. Uh, now, since then, um, uh, they've committed to many, many uh, operations. In, first, in fact, I first uh, met a general called Bambang uh, Susilo Yudoyono uh, in Bosnia uh, in 1995. Uh, and of course, Indonesia participated in the uh, UN uh, operation there. I mean, the other thing that uh, Indonesia can be, I, I hope, is, you know, an example of, of, uh, of tolerance and of progress in governance uh, to the wider Muslim uh, world. Uh, I mean, there are great distances between the Middle East and uh, Southeast Asia, but I think it's in Australia's interest and, and, and wider to see a, a dynamic Indonesian pol foreign policy and not necessarily a power projection, but you know, power in the wider sense, soft power, but also using their military resources and peacekeeping uh, further afield. Thanks, Michael. First, I've got uh, Doug Keane and then uh, Nick Stewart uh, from the Canberra Times. So, Doug, over to you. Uh, Lord Michael, uh, Doug Keane from Office of National Assessments. Uh, this isn't really a question. Uh, 
uh, it, it's more a cry for an art. Uh, you said that one of the big questions is what kind of a great power will China be? Uh, in your view, what is the ability and what is the willingness of the UK and Europe to influence what kind of a great power China will be? Thanks, Doug. Um, uh, I, I mean, I mentioned uh, earlier how um, uh, uh, what, a, what a good step I think it is that we have the Orkman uh, discussions now between um, uh, UK and Australia, uh, and that you know strategic discussions are in a way at the heart of uh, uh, those meetings. And I, I've spoken. Uh, to Foreign Secretary William Hague, and I know how much um, uh, importance he sets by these discussions. But I think it's very important that, that you as Australians keep us, the, the Brits, but also the French and Germans, uh, engaged in this region and also um, engaged in the, the, the challenge of uh, coping with uh, China's rise and analyzing that and uh, encouraging China um, along paths of uh, behavior uh, that would be, we think, helpful to them and helpful to us. I mean, over dessert there, we were talking about uh, North Korea. Um, uh, you know, very, very difficult uh, question, to say the least. But the, there is no way that the United States and its allies, Australia, the UK, and so on, can, can deal with that without a positive contribution from uh, China. Um, there's always the danger, particularly in the, the economic troubles in, in, in Europe at the moment, uh, that our energies, our attention become too focused uh, internally. I think in that regard, I mean, this government, you know, the Cameron government, needs to be commended for, frankly, getting a grip on uh, strategic priorities. And no matter how distant we are uh, in terms of uh, geography, ret retaining a strong interest uh, in Asia, and one which I, I hope can contribute to uh, the handling of China and the encouragement of, of China in positive directions. Thank you. Nick Stewart. Hello, Nick Stewart from the Canberra Times. Um, Jack Straw, writing, I believe, from the beautiful bucolic village of Minster Lovell in Oxfordshire, <laughs> has just suggested that maybe we need to actually get used to the idea of uh, Iran possessing a nuclear weapon. Um, I'm not sure that the view from Foggy Bottom would necessarily look quite so calm if that were to be the case. Um, I was wondering, what, what do you think, first of all, that we need to do? How do you think that the West is going to calm the heads of perhaps the new government in uh, Jerusalem, uh, or Tel Aviv? And um, uh, just what do you think is likely to play out there over the next couple of months? To a year. Gosh, okay. Um, well, Jack Straw was somebody I, I worked with very closely, obviously, and, in, and one of the, uh, the real endeavors when he was Foreign Secretary between 2001 and 2005 was to open a dialogue uh, with Iran, then under the leadership of President Khatami. Uh, and we went to Tehran and uh, Met with President Khatami, uh, I think on five, uh, six occasions, five occasions in Iran and once in uh, Davos in uh, Switzerland. Um, obviously, we talked to Iran a, a, about various issues, but the 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 nuclear one was uh, the core issue. Uh, we made quite a bit of progress, uh, and, and it's. I, I regret that we couldn't bring that to sort of fruition, 
Uh, I, I think, to be frank, you know, those were easier times in Iran. Uh, and it was possible to have, especially with Khatami, uh, a quite remarkable man I found, and then one who had sort of his own insights into the world. Uh, he'd spent many years in exile in, in Germany. In fact, German was really the one language he spoke uh, besides uh, Farsi. Um, but at, at the end of the day, uh, you know, we couldn't deliver um, the U.S. on that. The Bush administration was was uh, was not interested. Colin Powell was. Um, are we on the record, you know. Well, well, my best remarks you're going to miss then, Nick. Um, <laughs> Uh, Powell said sometimes once, and Jack asked what sort of what support for uh, 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 there is in uh, Washington for for this initiative. Um, and Powell said, "Well, you're talking to the key guy, and then there's uh, Ada, I think, his wife, and uh, Jack, his driver." Or <laughs> he, he said, "We're all with you all the way." Uh, in fact. Uh, I mean, it, 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 it's, it's uh, in Jack's memoirs to some extent now. Uh, uh, this was a bone of contention not only between uh, the US and the UK, Iran handling, but within government, dare I say it. And uh, I uh, remember one memorable conversation in uh, 10 Downing Street uh, with uh, Tony Blair where Jack started talking about, you know, this is a dangerous neighborhood, and if you're sitting in Tehran, you see the Israelis with nuclear weapons, you see the Russians, of course, and you see the Pakistanis, and you begin to think, well, why not us? Um, and that got short shrift from uh, uh, Tony Blair. It was something that uh, he uh, felt uh, uh, completely unacceptable. But that brings us to where we are now, Nick, and I think... Uh, uh, as I think I mentioned in my uh, earlier remarks, the talks from what we can gather in Almaty seem to have gone reasonably well. Uh, both sides put a positive spin on it and looking forward to um, uh, the next meeting. But it, it, it's not going to be easy to say the, the least. And in addition, of course, to uh, um, keeping the P5 in Germany are in, in, in one spot and having a common position between us all. Uh, there is, as you alluded to, uh, um, separately, the uh, position of Israel. Um, and how much time uh, uh, Israel might give uh, um, this initiative to succeed. I mean, I think as long as there is some traction in the... In the uh, uh, in the process, we're okay. Were the process to break down, um, then we, we could be heading for serious trouble. Question right from here and then to Ross uh, Tom Wazinski from Hewlett Packard. Uh, question around the non aligned nations. If I recall, Great. the 60s and the 70s and 80s, well, you had the luxury in the Asia region of, of nations had the luxury of being able to declare themselves as being non-aligned. Uh, with the rise of China as another significant power, do nations still have that luxury of declaring themselves non-aligned or do they have to have to put, uh, pin their colours on one or the other? And part B, where do you see Indonesia in 20 or 30 years' time? Are they large enough to retain that luxury of uh, staying non-aligned if they so choose or will they have to also choose? Thanks, Tom. Thanks for reminding me too about the the, the NAM, the Non-Aligned Movement. I mean, those are the good days. I mean, uh, um, I, I mean, this was a, a concept, of course, that uh, arose in the context of the Cold War, um, and uh, the perception amongst key countries, Indonesia being one of them, uh, India being another, and indeed Yugoslavia in Europe, and the Tito being. Uh, a key figure, actually. Um, and, and, of course, what they wanted was, was not to be drawn into the Cold War and to pursue a, a, 
uh, a separate path, namely that of uh, non-aligned movement. I think in, in now that you know the Cold War, thankfully, is 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 behind us many uh, years ago. But I actually believe that the non-aligned movement uh, played a positive role in a way in, in the denouement of uh, the Cold War and uh, of the, the Soviet Union. It perhaps helped that there was a, a third path. Now, in theory, the non-aligned movement still meets. Uh, I think one of the last summits was actually in Tehran. Um, uh, but it does not have the energy that um, uh, it, it used to, uh, energy or purpose that it used to have in the past. Now, with Indonesian friends, you have to be careful how you uh, address this with them, because the principle of non-alignment still means something uh, to them. Uh, and they, of course, they'll have bilateral agreements with Australia and US. On, on different uh, issues. But Indonesia could never be a treaty ally in the way that uh, the Philippines or, or Korea is. That, that's not going to, to happen. China, of course, is, was never a member of the non-aligned movement. Uh, not when it was a, an ally of the Soviet Union until the early 60s, uh, and not afterwards when it uh, broke away. Uh, and to some extent, you know, there is the risk that uh, countries in this region will come under great pressure. Um, China will use its economic strength to uh, try and bring countries uh, under its sway. But, you know, when I go around the region, um, what strikes me is a fairly common uh, uh, perception of, of, of China and sometimes you can be in, in Singapore or in Jakarta or in Hanoi uh, or even as I found in a recent visit in, in, in Rangoon um, where there's concern about China and its role. I mean, one of the wake-up points for me on Burma and the, a sign that it was really developing was when all of a sudden Tain Sein announced the uh, postponement, he didn't say the complete cancellation, the postponement of this huge Chinese infrastructure project on the, the, the Mitsoni Dam over the uh, Irrawaddy. And clearly there was a perception amongst uh, the, the Burmese military, I think, that they were moving too close. Now, China doesn't have that many friends. Cambodia is one, but uh, you know, thankfully Cambodia is not that critical a member of ASEAN. In fact, I think that that Burmese change was more of a shock to the Chinese it, I, 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 the I, I, Absolutely. Yeah. There was a lot of comment in, in, in China in the official press and uh, sort of on the blogs and the internet about that. Um, our last question is from uh, Ross Tyrrell. Thank you for an interesting speech. Why would you expect positive contributions from China on North Korea, when its interests in the matter and American interests are simply not the same. China has little to gain mm. from an end to the nuclear program in North Korea, and a lot to lose if there were to be either reunification of Korea or the collapse of the North mm -hmm. Korean government. So when the Americans ask help, as they sometimes do, I think it's quite unrealistic. China helps itself, mm. which is natural, and its interests are not ours. Um, well, well, Ross, first of all, uh, we've, we've never actually met, but I have long uh, followed your scholarship and uh, writing on uh, China. Uh, in fact, this was another issue as we uh, discussed over the, the dessert. Um, and you're right. Uh, the Chinese may dislike uh, some aspects of the regime in Pyongyang, but there is a, a danger that this would be a strategic game changer for them. First of all, Korea is united. It would be even more of an economic uh, power. Uh, and then what about uh, the treaty relationship between the United States and the Republic of Korea? Is that going to cover the whole country uh, up to the, uh, the Yalu River? Uh, nevertheless, perhaps China does have concerns about questions of nuclear and missile proliferation. In the context of the P5 uh, um, 
<clears throat> plus Germany talks on uh, Iran. China plays quite uh, uh, a positive role. Um, perhaps uh, some fears that uh, the North Koreans may go further, uh, and especially with regard to um, spreading um, uh, their knowledge and expertise uh, to other countries, including to uh, Iran. But I, I accept a lot of what you say, and it, it brings me back to one point. I, I sometimes think nowadays that our diplomacy, Western diplomacy in general, is not as active as it, uh, uh, it should be. Um, uh, it, you know, in, it, after 1962 and the crisis over, over Cuba, which uh, brought us so close to Armageddon, um, I, I mean, there was always a very active uh, U.S.-Soviet uh, 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 line of, uh, of communication. Of course, in '72, then Nixon and the historic visit to, to China. Maybe those times of great diplomacy have passed for various reasons. Um, but I, I'm, we need to do more, I think, to, to engage with China and to try and persuade it uh, um, that North Korea is, is not going to, uh, to continue forever and uh, paths forward uh, have to be found. Well, Michael, in a very short space of time, that's uh, quite a remarkable uh, tour de force uh, uh, from, from Makinda to Syria, from Burma to North Korea. We've, we've covered a lot of territory and, and beyond. And uh, can I thank you for your my, my pleasure. thoughtful contribution? Ladies and gentlemen, please thank Lord Michael Williams. Thank you very much.